We're about to hear from one of the most important CEOs in the world, Brett Adcock, CEO and founder of Figure AI, a leading humanoid robotics company. Check this bad boy out. And you, you guys today, just give people a sense as to where you are. You know, when did, you know, we heard a million, uh, you, you know, robots out at Amazon. Like, how, how should we be thinking about how many humanoid robots you guys are going to be producing, you know, two or three years out? I think to be candid, the, the problem that the entire space feels for humanoids is we have to solve like a general purpose robot. Yeah. You have to get to be able to like just talk to it and have it do anything you'd want it to do in unseen locations. That problem is not solved. That problem is 10 times, 50 times, 100 times harder than making a humanoid robot. Yeah. In my view. So the hill we need to climb, or the, like the hill we're trying to hill climb now, is how do we build a horizontal AI stack that can do everything a human can? And quite frankly, we have robots that are working in the commercial market as of right now, like to this very moment. And it's been really good for us to get those lessons learned, but it also gave us insight to build like, how, what is the right technology stack to go build? And that technology stack is like end-to-end -end deep learning. Okay. And so I think for us, we're trying to hill climb that problem. In parallel, we've now announced BotQ this year, which is our basically high-scale manufacturing facility out in California. We do all final assembly testing and robot shipping from there. And that problem is hard. It's more like a consumer electronics manufacturing problem, but it's not, it, it dwarfs in comparison to solving a general purpose humanoid robot, which is just like a, on the surface, just like an incredibly hard problem. It's tractable, it's, um, it's an approachable problem, but that's the problem we need to solve first. And then from there, we need to figure out how to manufacture at scale. That's like heavy automation. We need robots in the loop for end-to-end -end manufacturing. Um, and we're doing it now in-house. So we figure out how to build MES systems, how we build lines, uh, how we do end of line testing, how we deliver it to customer and make that better and validate it. So we're basically trying to get good at manufacturing while we're trying to solve the problems of like, how do we solve like for, uh, how do we basically solve general robotics? Um, listen, I think one thing we're proud about is we have a robot running right now and our first commercial customer, it's running like a 10 hour shift as we speak. We've been doing it for almost six months now. We've gotten like operational readiness there. It's running yeah. autonomously. Um, we've been trying to track like fault rates, like inter human intervention rates per like per shift. Those have all been dropping. Performance has been rising every single month. So we like we now have a better line of sight to what it takes to launch like a vertical job in like a con commercial world. What we're also trying to tackle and what we found like learned a lot last year is we need to solve like the horizontal stack. Like we need to be able to build true general yeah. purpose work to put robots into any uh, anywhere in the world. So we've basically refactored our entire like autonomy and AI stack from scratch. It's all done now end to end with neural nets. Uh, we think it's the only way to really scale and it's done at the foundation level so we can scale into any work. Um, so I think maybe to answer your question more directly, you will see robots in the commercial workforce over like now and in yeah. the next like year or two, we will try to put more and more out. We will try to get operation, like we'll try to get cost down, reliability of the robots up. We'll try to make it really real. In parallel, we're trying to solve a robot in the home. It's been in my home now for like three or four months. Wow. We're doing we're doing small parts of this, like small parts of laundry and folding and dishes. We now have to connect all of it together, like this tissue. We have to make it language conditions so we can talk to it. We have to put it in pixel space. So there's like a bunch of work in like AI models and foundation work and pre-training that we have to go do. Um, but we do see a path. It's like a little light in the tunnel that we want to go. We want to go at. It'll definitely be solvable. This like in like 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 this like this decade. Like it'll be solvable hopefully in the next few years that we can have it, uh, have this work. So we're excited about that, but that is like a more of like a, a, a car autonomy in a city versus car autonomy in a highway. These are, they're very different. One's like super unstructured, high variability, and like a lot of the engineering challenge is proportional to that variability. So like we're going head on with that problem. I would say you're gonna see them in the workforce over the coming year or two. And then we will we will only launch a product in the home, in the workforce at scale once we feel confident of the product. Right. We will not do it early. We will not teleoperate them in market. Like we will not do any of the silly stuff. Um, and I think that's maybe different from other groups, maybe in the space, but we are trying to build like end-to-end -end autonomy with low human intervention rates in these, in this commercial yeah. end market. So once we're able to like really sell into your home, to Brad's home, we want to be really confident it's going to really work and it's going to be really safe. Everyone wants to know when Figure AI will manufacture millions of humanoid robots, but Brett says that's solving for the wrong problem. Scaling humanoid robot manufacturing is actually the easier problem. The hard part is building general purpose AI that can handle any task in any environment without specific programming. And that's not to diminish the challenge of scaling humanoid robotics. That's actually an insanely hard challenge, but solving the AI problem is proving to be harder. Brett explains the entire humanoid space needs to solve general purpose robots and emphasizes the problem is not solved. It's 10, 50, or 100 times harder than making a humanoid robot. This reframes the entire conversation about humanoid robots. Most people think the challenge is mechanical, 
building a robot that can walk, balance, and manipulate objects like humans do. But Brett's saying that's actually the easier part. The nightmare problem is the AI. Think about what a human worker does. They walk into a new workspace, get basic instructions, observe how things work, adapt to unexpected situations, and figure out novel solutions when something goes wrong. They don't need to be reprogrammed for every new task. They generalize from experience. That's what general purpose means. Current robots can do specific tasks in controlled environments. A robot on an assembly line can put the same part in the same place a million times. But if you move that robot to a different facility with slightly different layouts, it breaks. If you ask it to do a related but different task, it can't. Every new task requires engineers to reprogram it. That doesn't scale. Figure's approach of end-to-end -end deep learning means training AI systems that go from visual input directly to motor commands without hand-coded rules for every situation. That AI needs to learn the same way humans do, through experience and generalization. That's fundamentally harder than engineering specific behaviors. But Figure isn't waiting to solve the entire problem before deploying. They're learning from real commercial deployments right now. Figure already has robots working in commercial environments today, which puts them at the start of an exponential learning curve where real world data accelerates AI development faster than competitors still in labs. Brett reveals Figure has robots working in the commercial market as of right now, which is giving them lessons learned and insights to build the right technology stack. This is a critical advantage that separates Figure from dozens of other humanoid robot companies. Most competitors are still perfecting robots in controlled lab environments or doing limited pilots. Figure has robots deployed commercially right now, failing and learning in real world places. That real world deployment data is exponentially more valuable than simulation or lab testing. In a lab, you control all the variables and test known scenarios. In actual commercial environments, robots encounter edge cases engineers never imagined. A forklift drives by unexpectedly. Lighting conditions change. A human hands the robot something in an unusual way. The floor is wet. These are situations where AI needs to generalize and you can't discover them without real world deployments. The lessons learned, feeding back into what is the right technology stack, is the flywheel. Each deployment generates data on what works and what fails. That data trains better AI. Better AI enables more complex tasks and more deployments. More deployments generates more data. That compounds over time in ways competitors still in development can't match. Having the manufacturing facility operational now while still solving the AI problem, I do think is good strategic thinking. The temptation could be to wait until the technology is perfect before building manufacturing capacity, but that could create a delay once you solve the AI, you still need 12 to 18 months to build manufacturing before you can scale. Figure is building both in parallel. The exponential curve is what matters for winner takes most dynamics. Being first with commercial deployment means more data, which means better AI, which means more capable robots, which means more deployments, which generates more data. Each cycle widens the gap between leaders and followers. Figure being in commercial deployment now while still improving the AI puts them on an exponential curve one of our clients started with zero audience. Now they're doing $100,000 months thanks to YouTube. And they're not alone. We've helped three businesses hit that level just by growing them a YouTube channel. Want to see how this could work for your business? Book a call with me below.